Good morning, everybody. I'm assuming we're on. Is that correct, Barb? <laughs> yes. We're live. We're live. Good morning, everybody. I am Lori Winters, founder and CEO of Thread. And thank you guys so much for um, joining us this morning. Just a couple uh, housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, you are currently on mute, but feel free to chat any questions you might have in the chat area. Um, there's also an event board at the top right of the screen. And in there, you'll be able to get information from today's webinar. We have uploaded a few sample um, templates and we're gonna talk about those as we go through. Within 24 hours, you'll get a copy of this, the recording. And so um, hopefully that will be helpful. Also, the last thing that I want to say is, you know, give us a little bit of grace because sometimes now that we're all uh, working virtually, we have some issues. So dogs may bark. I know Scott, who is our chief HR officer, um, has barking dogs from time to time if Amazon shows up to his house. So apologies in advance if that happens, please give us a little grace. So today what we wanted to share, you know, I'm kind of known as the PPP lady because we've been sharing a lot about the Paycheck Protection Program, but we also do other things than PPP. And we wanted to share some best practices as we're all getting back to a little bit normalcy in our work environment, at least somewhat. And today we want to talk about hiring and we're going to give um, in all of these webinars that we're doing, we want to give real actionable uh, information and things that you can actually use and not a bunch of fluff. So myself and my chief HR officer, Scott Masley, who heads up our HR outsourcing uh, division, are going to take turns today sharing some information on what we do for, that we feel like has worked really well from a hiring perspective. Scott's also going to share what to do, what not to do um, around interviewing. And we hope that this will be helpful for you. So without further ado, I am going to continue on. So everybody knows here that a hiring decision is a manager's most important decision. And I have seen this over the 16 years that we have built this business. Um, it is the most important thing you can do. So, you know, there's all kinds of challenges facing leaders and managers today. Um, there's market uncertainty over the pandemic that we're dealing with. Um, there is a lot of recruiting remotely that's having to be done and we're experiencing that right now. So we have uh, learned from some people that have companies that have been doing this a long time and we want to share some of those best practices. There's limited resources. A lot of companies are real lean right now as they scaled back to um, go through this crazy time we're living in. And you've got a lot of um, these new hires coming in, some are going to be remote, some will be hybrid, some will be in office, but training those new employees is a challenge. Um, that's a challenge when you're in an office and it's a bigger challenge when you're remote. So we're going to share some best practices around that. But three things that are definitely never changing when it comes to hiring. We all want to hire amazing people. We want to find and fill positions fast. And we also want to onboard efficiently and effectively. And I think most companies know that um, it's a big challenge to onboard new hires effectively, especially if you're a small business. So we want to try to share some information here and, and see if we can help, help you guys uh, get better. So what are the top things that we can do? And we are going to talk about each one of these in detail and give you hopefully actionable items on each one of these. Mm -hmm. So we need to know the success profile for each role and we'll go into each one of these in more detail. So I'm just going to quickly talk about them. We want to find ways to discover desirable traits. We want to design the candidate experience because as small businesses, we're competing with the real big guys out there for talent. And so some of the bigger companies have all kinds of resources focused on, you know, making it a great candidate experience. So, my belief is small business can do it even better. And we have done a lot around the candidate experience. We can leverage technology. Um, we have technology to offer around a lot of this, but there's other technology out there that will help you be efficient and also objective in your hiring. And then you want to design your employee experience, which we feel like we have uh, done a pretty good job of that. So we're going to share some best practices with you. So hiring number one, know the success profile for the role. 
I have done a lot of research on this. We have a PhD psychologist that has helped us um, in hiring. And one of the things that he had shared with us was define your non-negotiables and preferables, okay? Around experience, skills, education, software, values, uh, fit. And, you know, when we went through this exercise with him one time, he, we were talking about one particular role and we had, I don't know, 15 or 20 traits that we thought we had to have for that position. And then he said, okay, nobody's perfect. You're not going to get all of those. So now you need to stack rank those character traits and, and experience traits. So when you have to start ranking in order of importance for this position and this company, it was really difficult. And then you have to determine, so non-negotiables, which are the top five to 10 or five to six? You may not get more than five or six of them that you absolutely have to have. And one thing that we determined when we were going through that exercise is we realized that culture fit to our core values became the most important thing. You know, um, experience is something that, you know, depends on the position. If you're hiring a brain surgeon, I think you want experience. <laughs> but for a lot of positions, you can find great people that you can teach. But what you can't teach is how they fit into your core values. And if I look back at mistakes that I've made over hiring, it usually comes down to that. So we determined that was number one. And it depends on the job profile. So once you stack rank them and determine how many you, um, which ones are non-negotiable, then you create your job profile, which I'm going to show you an example of one of ours. Um, and then you've got to develop your job accountability description. So each one of those positions has to have specific accountability attached to it. As a small business owner, and I know this from experience, this stuff is not easy. And, but it is so important to get hiring right. If you're a big corporation, you can hire a lot of people and you can churn through them. If you're a smaller business, each individual really, really matters. So you want to get it as right as possible. So this is something I'm going to have to increase this size because I'm getting old. Um, I have an example of this that we are going to send out or it's going to be in the event board um, as a download. This is an example of one of our job profiles. This is for a sales development rep. It's an inside rep. And the way we do this is we give what are the top five responsibilities of each position? And I think it's important to do that and not to put, you know, a lot of people put a laundry list, you know, 15, 20 things they're responsible for. And if you're responsible for 20 things, you probably aren't responsible for much. You don't know what to focus your time on. So we put what are the top responsibilities. It took time as a leadership team to come up with those. And then when we talked about stack ranking, the most important character traits, we put in what takes it, what does it take to win? So in this case, I think we have three or four. Um, we want results driven, passion and tenacity. We want uh, curiosity and competitiveness because this is an inside sales role. They've got to be competitive. They've got to be curious. They want they've got to be able to be passionate and tenacious because they're going to be doing some cold calling, which is not fun. So this is an example of something that we put together as a position profile. There is a third page that gives compensation, benefits and things like that. So it's simple, but we feel like it works really well. It took us a lot of time to actually come up with each one of the profiles because we had to you know, stack rank what was important. This, a template of this is in the event board, so you'll be able to download it. And if you want to use it, you, you know, feel free to do so. So that is... Um, you know, in, and so in each one of these, you've got to find, dis, you know, discoverable traits. Let me go back down. Sorry, I've got to go back down to uh, hiring number two. And I'm sorry, I'm about to. <laughs> this is Scott. Scott, I'm going to hand it over to you for hiring uh, number two. Okay, appreciate it, Lori. Um, yeah, when you think about interviewing and hiring people, the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge initially is finding good quality people that might fit into the role that you need, right? With the skills and everything you need. Second challenge is once you've found all the people, you have a couple hundred applications in your applicant tracking system or your inbox, wherever they are, how do you then screen all of those people effectively to find your top candidates uh, so that you can, 
you know, assign your resources on your team to do interviewing face to face or over the phone or video, however you're doing it now um, to make the best use of that time and, and your money. So when you're interviewing anyone who's on this presentation or who's watching it later, if you've hired people, then you've had experiences in your career where you thought somebody was going to be great because they interviewed so well and then they got on the job and were a total dud and you're like, how did that happen? And it's because some people have learned how to interview. They're smart enough to be great interviewers and they convince people to hire them even though they're going to suck on the job. So you want to learn as much as you possibly can during your recruiting process, during your interview process. You want to have multiple people interview. I'll get to that. Um, but before you say, okay, let's start talking to people, you have to know kind of what you're looking for. And one way to help determine that is to use assessments. We're going to show you a couple of examples of assessments that, that we've used. And there are plenty out there. The most important thing with assessments is that you pick one or two that work for you and you make that part of your common language. So everyone on your team understands what the measurements are, what you're looking for. The general way to go about it is to say, OK, let's pick all of our uh, salespeople and let's give them this assessment. And then let's kind of off to the side outside of that determine who our best salespeople are, who our uh, middle of the road salespeople are and who our poor performers are. And then let's match up the traits with the best and the worst and that kind of thing so that you can say the traits we're looking for and the most promising candidates are the ones that they share with our best salespeople in that role, right? And then if people share the traits with the, your lowest performers, those are the ones you probably want to avoid because those are predictors of success in the job. Now it's not perfect, science, but it's a little more objective than Scott Masley sitting in a room going, I thought he was a great guy. Right. <laughs> and, and I tell Lori and my team, I like everybody. That's just my personality. I'm curious about everybody. So I am not the guy to decide whether someone would be a fit on our team because I feel like I could make everybody fit. And that's not the best way to go about it. So I've learned as an interviewer, where my strength is, is to really dig into competence and how you do the job. And I kind of drill people on those kind of things. And, and other folks on our leadership team are better at looking at personality fit and behavioral habits and things like that. So we, we do that collectively. But so use assessments as another source of information to help you make more objective decisions. And you can do that using some of the science that's already built into the assessments to identify those traits. So the idea of interviewing collectively versus just individually is I think you should do both, but there are two advantages to interviewing collectively. One is you get a group perspective. You get input from different people who are coming from different angles. Also from an HR perspective, it protects you because you're making a collective decision instead of just one person bringing their own individual unconscious biases or whatever they have with them and making that decision. So it limits the discrimination exposure you have as a company as well when you have a few people involved in that process. So I'm going to give you examples of some of the questions not to ask. And I'm also going to talk about some of the most common mistakes that I have seen uh, over 25 years in HR, working with hundreds of different small businesses. And I just sometimes get into an interview and just go, ah, we can't ask that, you know? So I'm going to give you some examples of those so you know not to ask those questions, right? And then just be as thorough as you can in the process. So are you having multiple people interview? Are you using assessments? Are you checking professional references? I don't care that your mom says you're the best person for the job. That really doesn't carry much weight for me because she's supposed to say that. What I want to know is people you have worked for, your boss, your peers, other people who will give real feedback on you. Um, there are software programs out there. Skill survey is one I've used in the past that worked pretty well that you can automate your reference checking instead of making phone calls and wasting time doing that. Um, and then I'm going to look at strength finders and achiever. Another big question I get about this is, can I look at Facebook, LinkedIn, all those things? Can we rule people out on what's on social media? Most employers nowadays do look at social media, whether they admit it or not. You just have to be careful in looking at that because you have to make sure that your hiring decisions are based on actual fit for the role. And the more structured you are in terms of what you've determined, the profile is and what you need. And you can say, this is a fit. You can prove that the better off you are. But if you have not gone through that process 
and you're just going, I don't like that picture on Facebook looks trashy. We're not going to hire this person. That's the kind of stuff that can get you in trouble if you don't have a system already in place on how you're hiring. So that's why it's really important to follow the kind of things we're talking about today. Uh, this is an example of the achiever. And this is one of the tools that we use. And what we've done is we've benchmark our team with this and we really use it to evaluate mental aptitude for different positions. Um, this is not something that we're going to like share with everybody, but the folks who are involved in the hiring decision are going to look at this and say, okay, where do, and you can see we have a couple candidates on there. How, where do they fall on this compared to our employees? So we know, for example, if employee number two, uh, scores a seven under memory recall, and that's what we're looking for, then I would match that up to candidate A who also scored a seven and say, okay, there's a similarity there. So it's just a way to discover more information than you would discover just by asking questions in an interview. Um, we have ranges for certain positions that we're looking for. We know that vocabulary is something that is an important metric for us, believe it or not, because we work on the phone, we work remotely, we support our customers over the phone. And if we're struggling for the right words to say, we could be wasting their time. So that seems, uh, that might seem to you like, why does that matter? But for us, it's important because we are in the customer service business. We want to take great care of all of our clients. So that's an important, important metric for us. And you can see at the top, there are low ranges and high ranges that can create red flags. Um, things to pay attention. This is just the second half of that report. So you can see there are things like team player versus individualist. You know, are they sensitive or tough? Those things do matter depending on the position, right? So we know out of our employees who does well, we look at their scores and then we compare the candidate scores to their scores using this achiever. Now here's another example of something we use called strength finders. And the way we use the strength finders is we actually have all of our employees names on this and we have it posted around our office on our refrigerator in the bake break room. And we sent it home now that everybody's working remotely. But the way we use this is we look at in the interviewing and hiring process where, where candidates fall based on the position. If I'm hiring someone for a management role and I, I can make this bigger, I guess, can I? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm looking for a management role, you can see down on the bottom, that person's in a management role. I want them to be high in strategic thinking. This person has a number one in that. So that's their highest trait on highest strength on there is strategic thinking. That's important. Our leadership team comes in pretty heavy on strategic thinking and influencing, which is great. We're looking at our ops team. We want them to be high in, in executing and relationship building and our sales team high in relationship building. So this is how we use this. But in addition to that, we use it to teach our uh, employees and team members how to work together and how to communicate with each other effectively because they understand where the people on their team are coming from. And this is, created some light bulb moments for us. So people go, ah, now I understand why so-and-so's eyeballs just glaze over when I'm doing X, right? Because we're not all the same and we have to learn professionally to adjust a little bit to each other if we want to work together effectively as a team. Now, in terms of interviewing specifically, these are the things you should not do, okay? These are the things I have seen over and over in my career that people do when they're interviewing and the number one is a biggie. So you have a very limited time to get to learn as much as you possibly can about your candidate, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour. And if you spend the first 20 minutes going, let me tell you about us and what we do, you've wasted 20 minutes because the best candidates have already researched your website and they know about you and what you do. And if they haven't, then they're not your best candidate, right? So you can get, you can tell them all about your company and how great it is later. Um, don't open with a big monologue. You just want to get right into building a little rapport, making them comfortable and then starting to ask questions and listen. So I tell everybody who's going to be interviewing candidates, ask, listen, ask more, listen. That's it. You should be asking and listening a lot. Um, and that's a theme throughout this. But if you ask close ended questions like, Hey, have you ever lost your cool with a customer? <laughs> Who's going to go? Yeah. You know, they're going to say no, even if they have. So versus a closing question, you ask an open ended question like how many times have you come close 
to losing your cool with a customer? And how do you recognize when that's about to happen? What are your triggers? What do you do to stay cool? What do you do to step away? Right? Those are all good follow-up questions, much better than a yes or no closing your question. Leading question. I see this a lot. And this is, Hey, Lori, um, you know, I, I really hope you're interested in this job. What I'm looking for is somebody with a lot of energy. Is that you? Yes, absolutely. Of course, of course it is. You know, any, any person with half a brain is going to say yes and is going to pick up on a leading question. So try not to do that. You don't also don't want to ask questions and create legal exposure. We're going to look at those in a second. Those are the questions to stay away from and then failing to pay attention. Believe it or not, everybody does this. It's hard, especially when you're in a group interview. Sometimes somebody's giving you a 15 minute answer to a question and you're like, <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden they go, right, Scott? And you're like, I don't even know what we're talking about. You know, you're making a laundry list in your head. So do force yourself to pay attention, be prepared, be mini alert. Um, keep your body language up there as well, because you are creating an impression on the candidate just like they're creating an impression on you. Your, your body language and your tone and your energy helps to sell your company um, subconsciously. So pay attention to all of that. Matching stories of personal experience is like if I'm, I'm happen to be a Georgia Bulldog, so I'm big on the Georgia Bulldogs. Lori's a Georgia Tech fan. But if somebody comes in the room and says, you know, I went to Tech my first two years and then I transferred to UGA because it's a much better school, then Lori and I are probably both going to jump on that conversation and start talking about Georgia and Georgia Tech. And we'll spend 15 minutes, you know, doing that, which is fine. And, and we can have fun with it, but you got to be careful uh, if somebody goes, you know, I'm really into fishing. Me too, the other day. And now you've wasted time. So that's really just about time. It is important to get to know each other, but be conscious of time. Selling before you're sold. Okay. This is when you get a candidate in and you might not be uh, decided on this candidate, but you want them to know how great the role is, how great your team is, how great your company is. So you make sure that you spend a lot of time convincing them about how great everything is at your company before you even know if you want to hire them. Now as a hiring manager, and I'm going to get real here for just a second, what that does is creates a, a group of people who are going to bug you like crazy to hire them when you've already decided you're not going to hire them because now they're, you've sold them on how wonderful your company is, but you've decided you don't want them, but they're going to be all over you because they want to join your company. So don't sell them on how great everything is until you want them. That's when you really start the wooing process, right? When you think I might really want to hire this person. And then number eight is kind of what we're talked about before and we'll continue to hit during this presentation, which is, you need to know in advance what you're trying to get out of this interview. What are your values? How do you determine those values? What questions are you going to ask? You don't just want to wing it because you may forget important things and you only have a brief window to ask all these questions. So we had a video here we had it teed up, but it was playing like an old uh, martial arts film where the mouth is moving and the sounds coming later. So we won't, we won't put you, through that, but we can share it later for fun. It was a uh, video of me asking all the questions you should not ask. So we put this in here and we will send this to you as well. Um, on the left side of this, you see the topic that people ask about in the middle. It's what you could ask, which sounds very legalese. A lot of times says nothing like, Hey, what can you ask about someone's race? Nothing. Why would you ask about someone's race? Right? What can you ask about their religion? Nothing. Now the questions I've seen people ask is, Hey, where do you go to church? Here's where I go. Right. Or, you know, what kind of religious holidays are you planning on taking or where were you born? Where'd you get that accent? All these kind of questions you have to be very careful about because they're implying something else. I've had people say, you know, that was my wife on the phone. Does yours ever call you at work? Are you married? Do you have kids? Are you planning on having kids? And if you are, when are you planning on having them? All those things you got to stay away from because there are protected classes. Um, and so you don't want to not hire somebody based on their membership in a protected class, based on their race, their religion, their age, pregnancy, military status, veterans, you know, all those things. So stay away from all that kind of stuff. You don't want to ask people how old they are during an interview. Um, you don't want to ask them if they live in an apartment versus a house. You don't want to ask them if they've ever been arrested. You can do a background check later. 
So stay away from these things. If someone looks like they might have a disability, you don't want to say, is that a disability or what's wrong with your arm or anything like that? You, you can ask the question like, are you able to perform the essential functions of this job with or without reasonable accommodation? That's the legal question to ask about that. So just pay attention to the things on this list and don't get yourself uh, in trouble. Another thing I've learned in working with a lot of small businesses, you know, we do HR consulting for small businesses on top of our payroll services for them. And one of the things we help them do is help their supervisors and managers to be trained so they feel confident interviewing people, hiring people, giving them performance feedback, doing terminations, whatever they need to do in their role as a supervisor or manager, we help them with the words to say, what not to say, when to do it, how to do it, everything else. So they feel confident in doing that. And, and if you're a client of ours, you're probably scheduling some interviewing training with us already, or may have already done some. If you're a prospect of ours, get on board, sign up with us and uh, we'll help you do all of these things. So we want managers to understand what the expectations are, what the big picture is, and then how to execute in their role in this process. So another thing you're really looking for with your candidates and what the, what the language we use at Thread is do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity to do it? In other words, um, are they competent? Are they confident? That's another way to look at it. Are they eligible for the job? Are they suitable for the job? These are terms that I've heard, you know, the way people look at this, but basically what you're looking for is, are they qualified for consideration based on their skills and experience and everything else, right? Do they understand what the job requires? That's the get it. Do they get this job and know how to do it? Want it is a whole different thing. You know, I, I'm actually really good at math, but I don't enjoy it. So uh, even though I was taking calculus and stuff and high school and everything, I just, I hated it, but I always got good grades at it. But as soon as I didn't have to take it, I stopped taking it, right? So it's not something I want, even though I get it, I don't want it. I don't want to do that every day. So it's just as important to tell people, this is what you're going to be doing every day. An example of that is if you have a warehouse manufacturing facility and you're going to interview somebody who's going to work in that, I would interview them walking around the manufacturing plant. This is what it smells like. This is what it feels like. It's hot. This is what you're going to get dust on yourself, you know, get people a realistic picture so they don't show up day one and go, Ooh, this isn't for me. Tell them what it's really like. And then say, is this what you want? Is this what you're looking for? And then do you have the capacity for it? So be intentional about the questions you're asking, the assessments you're using, what you're looking for in references, what your non-negotiables and deal breakers are, what your must haves are, um, and all of those so you can make a more objective decision. This is an example of the way we evaluate folks when we are interviewing. So when we're interviewing collectively or individually, our team uses this scorecard here and up at the top, it has our values at thread, which are deliver wow, attitude of gratitude, make it better, own it and have fun. Those are really important to us to be a fit onto our team and into our culture. Um, so we all continue to be a high performance, high culture company. So we, we have a minus minus plus and a plus uh, metric here. And basically what we do is we look for pluses. So if people have a, a couple minuses on there, then that can be a no go for us and take them out of the running. We also do have the measure I just talked about, get it, want it. Do they have the capacity to do it? And then down below, are they positive, personable, persistent, the things that Lori mentioned earlier. So we are looking for these specific things in our interview, in our assessments, in our reference checks, in our peer interviews, every, every step of our process, we are focused on discovering as much as we can about these values and these key attitudes so we make the best hiring decision we can do. And that's how you can structure it and keep yourself on track as you're going through it. Lori. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that, um, the get it, want it capacity to do it. And the, um, that, that piece that Scott just went over, we also have that, I think in the event board that you can download, we put a template out there and then you can change it to however you want to. We follow a process called EOS entrepreneurial operating system. 
Um, there's a book that was written called Traction, and that's where we the get it, want it, capacity to do it came from that. I highly recommend that book for any company that's looking for ways to improve performance, um, hiring, and uh, just running the business in general. So it's it's a great uh, it's a great resource. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, hiring number three. We need to design our candidate experience, and this is hard. <laughs> but it's so important. If you go on Glassdoor, you um, you know candidates now can talk about how their experience was with interviewing with your company, and it's important. You know, we we take that serious. We've had some really good reviews, and we've had some negative reviews on how we've handled candidates in the past. Some of the negative reviews were just taking too long. You know, not getting back to them. Um, so we've really redesigned our candidate experience because everything is real transparent nowadays and you want your company to be a place where people want to work. And so, you know, you want to make it easy to apply, number one. And so we use different uh, technologies to do that. I think Scott's going to talk a minute about the technologies we use for that. But you want to make it easy to work with you. Um, you want to send status updates so many times. I have a daughter who I know when she was interviewing out of college, sometimes would hear nothing, you know, and that is that hurts. That's hard. You don't realize as an employer, you forget how hard that is to interview for a job. But making sure people know what the status is throughout the whole uh, process. And when you decide that they're not the right candidate, they need to know that, you know, and a lot of times candidates are just left out to wonder what happened and they're still waiting to hear when you've already moved on. And I think it's only fair to make sure that you're giving status updates throughout the whole process, you know, respect their time. They're busy just like we are. They're trying to find job. Um, and so we want to make sure that we respect their time and that will show in your glass door reviews. And when you're going to find really good talent and you've got great glass door reviews as a candidate experience, you can point them to that and say, hey, we're, you know, we don't just say it. We practice what we preach. So um, main thing for me is do it better than your competition. We want to be a better place to interview candidates, even if we make a decision that it, they're not the right fit because it's a fit thing. It's also is it the right fit for them? And so but we want to do it better than our competition. You know, we've got big comp competitors out there in our industry, in our space of payroll. We want to be the best, you know, when it comes to um, designing that candidate experience. So, Scott, you're up. All right. Woo mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's there's so much technology available now for you, uh, way more than when I was starting as an HR guy in the 90s, copying and pasting newsletters, like literally copying and pasting <laughs> newsletters back in the day. There is so much awesome technology that it can be hard to choose, but I would say choose some of it for sure. Don't go technology less out there in today's world. It's affordable and it will save you so much time and make your job better and your life better. Trust me. So choose some of this uh, uh, technology and take advantage of it. So. The two big areas that I see when we start working with clients and we're helping them with their HR program is a lot of times they uh, might not have a applicant tracking tool or an online application process. Sometimes they don't have a career page that people can upload resumes to. So there are some basic things you can do pretty, pretty easily now, like creating your online application process over there on the left. You see there's my interview. Uh, and workable. Those are examples of things you can use. My interview would be to set up a, a video interviewing now that most people are re interviewing remotely. Sorry, my mouth stopped working for a second. Interviewing remotely. And so if you're doing that, you can use tools out there to help organize that process, you know, to send the interview, to assign the questions, gather them. If you don't want to get that structured, you can literally tell people everybody has a mobile phone these days. Here's an email, answer these questions and send me your video back, right? You can do it as basic as you want, but those just help to keep things organized and efficient. But you should have an online application process where somebody goes to your careers page, clicks apply here, they see a job description, they answer a few questions, which are screening questions, which are the non-negotiables we talked about earlier, which helps you eliminate the candidates who are not going to be a fit without having to interview them. 
Um, you can set up through an iSolved, which is the payroll platform, the kind of end to end A to Z platform that we work with here at Thread. We have a program called iHire, which is integrated with iSolved and it's an applicant tracking program. It works awesome. You can automate your background checks, the application process, the offer letter, sending your drug screen consent form, sending people to do the assessments, all that can be built right into the system as well as video interviewing. So it can really do all of that along the way. And if you're interested about in that, let us know. It ranges a few hundred bucks per client, anywhere from 150 to 375, depending on the size of the client per month. So very affordable. And if you're doing a lot of hiring and recruiting and interviewing, it, it trust me, it is worth your time. Uh, I think anybody would be crazy not to do something like that. In terms of paperless onboarding, I also see a lot of small businesses still handing out a paper packet to new hires to sign on their first day of work or to print 20 pages at home before they come in. And you really don't need to do that anymore at all. You can get rid of trying to read people's handwriting, uh, smudgy signatures and dates and all of those things by setting up your onboarding in the HR module of iSolved or whatever payroll platform you're on. And you can just literally send a link, people click the link, uh, digitally sign all of their new hire forms. So everything is clean, dated, signed, all in one place in the system that you can report on it, audit it, everything that's right there. Get rid of all the file cabinets that are taking up space, You know, hang some art on the wall or do something fun instead with that space, right? And it can also help you communicate with your applicants um, and then update your pre-hire and new hire processes. This is something we do when we're doing HR consulting for our clients as we go, the pre, we talk through the pre-hire process, new hire process, uh, and then we do opportunities for improvement. Then we implement those improvements, document the process again. We help them with the forms, policies, everything. So just make sure that you've got that stuff up to speed, compliant with the laws that change all the time. And that the idea is to improve that candidate experience, but also help you make the best hiring decision you can make by leveraging the technology that's out there. Yeah, I, um, I highly recommend using that technology because hiring, it takes so much, so much time and effort. And the video, the video interviews, um, just the initial screening has been really helpful for us. Um, because you can see how a candidate is going to um, be able to present themselves, you know, professionally um, and how they answer just very basic questions can kind of help you filter through. And that, that's been a real helpful tool for us. Um, our last tip here is designing the employee experience. So we, you know, Scott talked a little bit about um, the onboarding piece. And I feel like this is, you know, when you, have worked so hard to find that right candidate. Now you're ready to bring them on. You want to do it really well. And it's amazing how poorly this is done in so many companies out there. Not, not all small companies either. I've seen some large companies where this is done very poorly. Um, I remember like an example of my daughter's first day and her first job out of college, she was told to ask for her hiring manager. She got there, asked for the hiring manager who happened to be on vacation that week. You know, that's not a, great, not a great experience. So um, we feel like, you know, the onboarding, the paperless onboarding now with technology the way it is, it's a great first impression. You want your business to look, you know, at least not, that doesn't have to be cutting edge, but at least up with the times. So first impressions do matter. And we want to wow the employee with a great plan. So we, we spend a lot of time and energy on, um, the first couple weeks of an employee's time with Thread. And we would even, I'd be you know, uh, willing to share some of those templates out that we've done. Where we really spell out what each week looks like. And we want to get that in, you know, get that in their hands in an electronic format, especially now that we're hiring uh, virtually, which makes it even more important to be able to do this. I think it's, it's definitely pushed the need for electronic uh, and paperless systems more than ever. Um, we definitely feel that onboarding is not a one day thing. You know, we need a, a real good plan and we'll share this with you of a first day, a first week, a first month and what that looks like exactly. So we like our new hires to get that in their hands 
before they start with us. So they know what to expect. You can remember um, even little things like what should you wear to work the first day? So many of these things, you know, remember when your first job, you know, you go and you take the job and you're so nervous, you know, it's really great if you are, are given something that makes your you know, introduction to the company more positive. So we like to really share, we share that with them prior to starting. Um, and we want them to be able to build relationships with their teammates and with their other colleagues. So, you know, some examples of that are do little video connections. Like um, we've done some virtual happy hours. We do virtual connections now, interdepartmental connections that we started as we're all virtual. Um, that's been so helpful because what we're missing by not being in the office every day is the um, you know communication we have in the break room. So getting to see people that aren't on your team. So we're doing a lot of virtual uh, connection, video meetings, you know, virtual coffees, virtual happy hours. Um, and then, you know, make sure that, you know, you're, you're um, able to help your new hire have a mentor, you know, and a, and a kind of a buddy, so to speak, in the, in the company so that they're not alone when they come in. Um, th that's, you know, I think this is so important to that employee. You can't fix a bad first day or a bad first week really easily. And you know, same thing when it comes to clients. If we do a poor job of implementation, um, we feel like we do a great job, but we've, we've had our, you know, we've had challenges from time to time. It's really hard to recover from that. Same thing with a, with a bad hire. When you bring somebody in in a negative way, it's really hard to change that. It takes a long time. Scott, is there anything you would add to that? Yeah, I, I just want everybody who's on this right now or who's watching it in the future to know that you are not alone if this is stressing you out because this is one of the hardest things to do and it, it is very difficult for every company I've ever worked with. Every company I've ever worked with has said, I wish we had a better onboarding orientation program, whatever you want to call it, because we, we it's hard to do great at that. The reason it's so hard as a small business is I don't have an onboarding team where they spend their time. You know, my job is to meet new employees and walk them through their first week. Everybody who's involved in this process has a full time gig that's keeping them very busy and they're having to carve time out to spend 30 minutes with a new employee or an hour with a new employee. Or if you're the one in charge of making all this happen, it's days of preparation, but it has to happen. It has to be a priority. And so there's a very big difference between like Lori said, employee comes in day one and the person they're supposed to meet with is not even there. Um, I was even hired for a job way back in the day where I showed up and the guy who I was supposed to report to didn't even know I had been hired. So they didn't <laughs> know who I was, what I was supposed to do or anything. Um, that's a bad experience, right? But imagine if your first employee, before they start, you've already reached out to them and you've told them when to get there, what to wear, whether or not they should bring lunch, what to expect for their first day, what to bring with them, all that kind of stuff. You've sent them their schedule ahead of time. They show up, you're, they, you show them their space and it has all their swag bag and stuff there for them, their logo items and things. It has a list of their logins. <clears throat> you know, Here's the software you're gonna be working with and here are your logins. They're already set up. Here's your laptop, it's already in place. This is your pen, your notebook, You know, whatever you need, it's all ready to go. And then here's what we're gonna do today, tomorrow, and then what I like to add to that is as the manager, what do you expect to be done first day, first week? So I like to say, okay, at the end of day one, here's what I want you to know, right? I want you to know who do you talk to for what? At the end of the first week, here's what I want you to be able to do. At the end of the first month, here's what I want you to be able to do. Here's what I want you to know. Because again, that keeps everybody on track in terms of what you're doing is intentional instead of just going, go spend 30 minutes with our new employee. No, everybody who's spending 30 minutes with that employee should have a reason why. So you're, you know, Lori, you're sitting down and spending 30 minutes explaining the values of our organization and maybe the mission and, and where we're headed. I might be spending 30 minutes talking about our culture. Someone else spend 30 minutes saying, you know, here, here are some of the unwritten rules that you might not know about, but we're going to spare you any embarrassment and tell you what they are in our office right out of the gate. You know, don't ever call this guy by his nickname because he hates that. Whatever they are, you just let them know up front. I used to tell people, look, if you bring a gun to work or punch somebody in the face or come to work high or whatever, that's not going to work. So let's just agree on that day one. 
so that we can avoid that right out of the gate, you know, keep it simple, make it, make it easy for people. You know, one thing to add on that is, um, Scott's been spending a decent amount of time for our, we're redoing our handbooks. So we, we, we do handbooks for clients and we've been redoing ours to make it more, um, just easy to read. Not as much, you know, it's not 25 pages, but there's some really good sections in it about here's what's cool. Here's what's not cool to do. And just making it easy, a little more fun for people that start working for you, but to spell out your policies in a little bit more easy to read format. You know, I think I think that's one um, one good way to do that because you get a 25 page handbook that's going into you know legalese and detail. It's really hard to pay attention to that and get anything out of it. So there's some really cool things that I've seen being done on um, on handbooks. So we've got a couple of questions, Scott. Um, I'd love to um, get your input on on this first one. This is something that is real big right now. Um, you know, diversity and inclusion has become an important focus for hiring and retention. You know, what, what is our approach to help clients with this? And I'm going to let you talk, Scott, on this. I'm also going to say, you know, I this has been a big thing for me. I've, I've spent a good bit of time um, looking into this. There's a lot of products that can help, you know, technology wise uh, when it comes to interviewing to um, or at least candidate searching to, you know, be a little bit more open minded when it comes to how you're determining who you're going to interview. Um, I think it starts all the way from the interview process, which resumes you're picking. And there's a lot of tools around how to um, make that uh, more, you know, make people who are making those decisions more open, open minded to those. Um, I've also spoken to some companies and, and Scott, I'll let you talk through this, but that have, you know, built whole organizations or committees around how to do, you know, how to be more, how to add more diversity if it's a company where, you know, that's lacking diversity or how to be more inclusive and making sure that when you're making decisions on not just hiring, but who you're going to promote, that you're looking at things through a very um, open lens, you know? And so, you know, Scott, I'd love your input on that as well. Yeah, I think you, you know, there, there are larger companies who have greater resources, who have committees and teams and diversity officers and, and they do, they can do all kinds of stuff that small businesses might not have the resources to do. So most of our clients are smaller businesses, you know, usually under a few hundred employees. And what I talk to them about is there are just some simple things. Like one time I had a guy say, can we require people to put their picture on the application so I can see what they look like? And I'm like, well, probably shouldn't do that. You know, um, if you are looking at social media before you hire, somebody or whatever, then that's something that could affect your decision in that way. Right? So if you say, look, we may have some kind of unconscious bias on our team. If you haven't done any training on that, you should. So people know what that is and they're aware of it. Right? But if you, if you think, okay, in the real world that exists on most teams, most leadership teams, hiring teams, everything else. So how do we limit that? Well, one way to limit that is by following a system or a process like we talked about, which is really all about qualifications for the job, um, assessments, right? Like when you, when people take assessments, it's based on the information that they input in the form. And as long as that assessment has, has been validated and is credible, then you can use that information objectively, which helps you make a more objective decision um, that's not based on individual biases or anything like that. I also think you need to look around your organization. I mean, that's the easiest thing you can do is look around and say, do we have a diverse team or not? And if you don't, okay, then maybe you should start moving in that direction a little bit. You should ask yourself, why don't we have a diverse team? What's keeping us from, from having a, a more diversity and inclusion? Right. And diversity and inclusion are, are two different things. Um, you know, diversity is uh, if you look around and you see people who say, OK, they look different. Right. That's a very simplistic explanation of that. Right. Because it's, it's way deeper than that. But inclusion is more than just saying, hey, I got some, you know, different people of different races and backgrounds on my team. Right. Inclusion is, OK, uh, I, I'm on the team, but do I get to play? You know, am I included? Am I a peer? Am I an equal? You know, if, if you look at your leadership team and everybody looks the same and then you look at your group employees and everybody looks different, then that's something to pay attention to. 
And that's kind of how I approach it as a, as a pretty practical, realistic perspective is how are you making these decisions? What do you see when you look around? Do your employees feel that you have a diverse workforce? You know, doing a survey helps as well. And I know this is a long answer to a short question, but there are so many different ways you can go to influence that in your organization. But I think it all starts in the beginning with hiring. How are you recruiting? How are you hiring? Where are you going to look for people? You know, if you're pulling all your candidates from the same place, you're going to have a limited uh, candidate pool. So you need to be open to where you're pulling candidates from, where you're posting your jobs and all that stuff as well. And I, I see we have more questions coming in. Let's see here. How do I get identification information for their I-9 when, it, when onboarding remotely? Okay, that's a great question. So right now, this is a very unique time in, in our history, the first time ever in my career, over 25 years in HR, where you do not have to physically touch the I-9 supporting documents, the passport, driver's license and everything. You are allowed right now during all this pandemic stuff to view those over a Zoom meeting or something else. And then you still have to get a copy. So you're, so the people you hire still have to upload and submit a copy to you via email or through your onboarding platform, whatever you're using, but you can review those over video or via picture, Zoom, stuff like that, and approve them in that way. So that's pretty easy. They can just hold it up, show it to you, and you go, it looks legit. And move forward with section two of the I-9, and then they need to send you those so you have copies of them for your file to prove that you looked at them. Um, I, I like this question, Scott, about do we need to, if we are interviewing in person, do we need to require masks or, or stay six feet apart? What is your recommendation on that? I, th I think right now you have to do one or the other. It, it's very difficult to interview somebody when you're wearing a mask and they're wearing a mask because a lot of communication is, you know, looking at people's faces and their expressions and are they smiling or not. And it's hard to tell that with a mask on. We have asked candidates that we've interviewed face to face how they feel about it. Um, so far, everyone has said, I don't, I'd prefer not to wear a mask because I want to have a human physical connection with you. So that's why a lot of people are doing these virtual interviews because you can do it without a mask, but you can also sit on opposite ends of a conference table. So we've had people who we all wore our masks into the room, did our intros, distanced, and then removed our mask to the interview and then put them back on at the end. So that's another possibility as well. Let's see, can you ask questions about pre-existing conditions such as back or neck problems? So, you know, you can ask, the only thing you can ask is, are you capable of performing the essential functions of this job, right? If you have a, we call it a job accountability form, what other people call it a job description. In that job description, you should have things like the physical requirements of the job. So that when I show it to you, you look at it and it says, you need to be able to lift 25 pounds. You need to be able to climb up and down a ladder. You, whatever those things are, you need to be able to do those things, right? So then when you ask somebody, can you meet the expectations of this job? Those are included and you can review those with them and, and ask them about those requirements as well. It is not going to help you to do a health questionnaire or a medical questionnaire. I know that there are workers comp uh, attorneys who sometimes tell people to do that. That is much more likely to get you in trouble than it is to ever help you. So I tell my clients to stay away from those. There used to be a thing where you could get reimbursed for workers cop claims for people who had previous back injuries that doesn't exist in most states anymore. Um, the workers cop carriers will run checks on people when they file claims to see if they're the, if, if this is their job. There are people who go out there and fake back injuries from company to company and that's their business um, and they can help you discover those. You can do in the interviewing process, look, hey, could you lift? this box 20 times a day, but you can also have somebody get hurt lifting that box during the interview. And then now you're responsible for it. So you got to be careful with those kinds of things. I want to, I want to touch on this one. Can you provide some good examples of questions during an interview? One, one that we've determined is really, really good is tell me a time when. So if I'm interviewing um, for a position that's customer facing customer support, I may ask the question, tell me a time when a customer made you upset 
frustrated you and how did you handle that? Um, always situational questions are the best. So not ha has a client ever made you upset or, but tell me when, because we know in support and customer facing role, everybody has dealt with some type of frustration. So, you know, tell me a time when a customer frustrated you, give me an example, and then how did you handle it? Um, same kind of thing for sales with, you know, very situational uh, situations. You know, tell me a time when you failed to hit your quota. Um, probably that's happened to every sales rep at some point. Tell me what you did. What was your plan of action? And how did that, how did that, re, how did you rebound from that? Tell me about a time when you failed and what did you do to respond to that failure? Those are the kind of questions I really like. They're situational questions that are open-ended and get to know a lot more about that candidate. I like to ask questions like, uh, you know, if you're interviewing a dental hygienist, right? I'll say, what what do most dentists get wrong? What could <laughs> what could they do better? You've had a few of these jobs in different dentist offices. So what do they do well and what do they do poorly? And if you were if you were the one making those decisions, what would you do differently? And that lets you know, has someone thought about having an impact on the organization more than just showing up and doing a job, right? And you can ask that in any role, you know, what do churches do wrong? What could they do better, right? Uh, HR, if I interview a payroll person, I always ask that. What do most payroll companies get wrong? How could they be better? What's, what are you looking for when you're evaluating a payroll system? You know, walk me through your process on how you audit your payroll before you hit the submit button. I'm looking for what do they know? Do they understand the things that they should understand walking in the door? Also ask questions like, if we were to call your friends, what would they say about you? You know, fill in the blank. When I need X, I call Scott. You know, what are you known for? That kind of stuff. Um, so those are, those are just a few examples of questions you can you can ask. I like the, uh, one that we'll, we'll wrap it up because we're heading, we're heading to the end of the hour. But I like the question that was just posted. Um, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts for virtual orientation and onboarding with HR? Do you lose the initial connection? And this is a really good question that a lot of us are dealing with right now. Um, and I go to a couple of uh, our partners and contacts that I would love, you know, that have been doing virtual 100% remote, uh, you know, employees for years and years. And, you know, we got some good information on that, on how to onboard and make it a good ex uh, experience. You know, we are still trying to meet with our new hires in person a couple times and uh, especially during orientation. But there are companies that do 100 percent virtual onboarding and, and hiring. And I think it's definitely doable. It's just how you. The, the one thing that this one, the, a partner of ours that has been remote for 10 years gave, said to us is communication in a regular business when everybody's in person is important, but when you're virtual, it's even more important. So if you need to communicate something five times in a virtual environment, you need to communicate it 10 times. And I think the way that, um, you know, through these video meetings, you can have a good connection with people. You really could onboard uh, people virtually. Uh, we're going to do another town hall or webinar talking about learning management because that's another way to help train you know, how do you train people that are coming in virtually? That's a whole other, that's a whole other can of worms that's, you know, complicated now. But, um, you know, and I think making sure that you connect people to other individuals in the company to do virtual relationship building. So Scott, do you have anything to add before we end this on uh, onboarding virtually? Well, I mean, I know it's challenging. It's hard for everybody. Some of us are just so much more comfortable being face to face but it is what it is and we got to adjust and make the most with what we've got. And I, and I think a lot of us are changing the way we might do business going forward. Once we realize how capable we are uh, mm -hmm. doing these video meetings and not spending four hours a day in the car, driving back and forth and things like that. But it, you know, I prefer the face to face, but I realize that that's probably not going to happen much for a while. And so we're saying, how can we do this best? And uh, the biggest tip I would say is you got to be pre prepped for it and you got to bring a lot of energy to it. Right. Absolutely. 
Well, we're at the end of the hour and I just want to say thank you to everybody that came on here today. Make sure you go to the event board and download the tools that we put up there. If there are other things that you want information on, uh, please let us know. We can give you information on the assessment tools that we use, the Achiever. Um, again, it's about benchmarking. And I think that that has been a huge uh, tool for us. Uh, strengths finders, any other information that we may have brought up that we didn't share, please let us know if you want more information on it. We'd love to help because I think this stuff is so important to get right. So thank you again. And I hope everybody has a great day.